I'm Marilyn McKenna. I, um, I am a writer of the book that she mentioned. Um, and I, I kind of made her say the whole thing. I was up, you know, sleepless um, many, many nights coming up with that, that subtitle. And, and I had to kind of uh, cut, my, um, cut my fears, uh, uh, push them aside about using that word badass. Because I was, you know, I actually was turned down by an agent because <laughs> for the reason that that, that that was in there. There's the first slide. Thank you. And a blogger, so I hope you'll come find me at MarilynMcKenna.com because I write about this stuff all the time. Uh, and I am the fiercely proud mother of four kids. They range from 28 to 16. Okay, now we're going, we need to go back to the first slide. <laughs> Not that these aren't fantastic, just to see, you know, um, as a slideshow. Um, but yeah, so the one of the fat me is the first slide because that's sort of the beginning of the story. Keep, there you go. All right, now we're on. Um, so yeah, so, um, so th this is the, the, the green, that's me. And um, I, I weighed um, 265 pounds, I, what I think is my heaviest, although um, I, I didn't get on a scale for quite a long time, so it, it's, it's entirely possible that that's not, not completely accurate. Um, but um, in 2007, after having been morbidly obese for more than 20 years, I had a sort of rock bottom kind of experience. And um, it, it shook me to my core. I'm, I, I don't want to talk too much. I mean, we can, we can talk about that if you want to. But really what I want to talk about is the, the, the five things, which you've already seen, the slides, uh, the five things that I think that I've really learned from this experience. And I will say, you know, it's a, it's a journey, it's a path, it's all those things, you know, that we talk about, um, you know, in this kind of experience, transformative experience. Um, but, um, but it's really, it's, it's, it hasn't ended. I mean, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing, um, I, I say all those annoying things now, like if you're not, you know, if you're, if, it, if an apple doesn't sound good, you're not really, it's not real physical hunger and things like that just would have pissed me off when I was fat. Um, but, you know, stuff like that is true, as is, you know, it's a lifestyle and, you know, it's the, it, you know, it, no, it has no expiration date and yada yada and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, um, but those are the same pants. So I am almost, almost literally half my size. And um, what I'm going to talk about is really um, how I overcame, you know, all those years of dieting, uh, yo-yoing, um, hating myself every night when I went to bed, how every Sunday night I would, you know, steal myself for yet another, you know, diet, whatever the diet was going to be that week, and, and how instead I really transformed myself in, in every way, and my, my life, not just my physical body. Um, so let's start with that. Transformational change happens when the pain of change is really less than the pain of staying the same. I borrowed this quote from Alcoholics Anonymous, um, if, if it sounds familiar to you. And it's, it's really very, very true. And it was my experience. So when, when I had that transformative change, um, the pain that I was in every single day in living in this body that I felt nothing but shame and humiliation about, um, which, I, I, which then led me to isolate myself from others, was, um, was just, it, it was unbearable. It was absolutely unbearable. Um, and at some point I had, to, um, I had to confront what I really feel is the number one reason why diets fail. The one reason why we go on these diets, you know, steal ourselves every Sunday night, right? Who, who's never been on a diet? Have you never been? Okay, there's just like a few people, which is like confirmation that there are aliens among us. <laughs> um, so where's the astronaut? We need the astronaut. Um, but, you know, okay, so we're pretty familiar with this scenario. But, I mean, I really am convinced that the one thing that prevents us from succeeding is ambivalence. 
Um, because, I mean, you know, you know this feeling, right? If you've dieted, like, like you want it so bad on Sunday night when you're laying there and you're planning out your week. And then, you know, Tuesday happens and you forget that the kid has a dentist appointment and your husband forgot to pick up the kids for soccer and there's nothing for dinner. You forgot to defrost it. I mean, life happens, right? And you get, you're busy, you're stressed and, you know, we fall back into our old patterns. Or maybe even you do it for a week or two. Um, but we fall back into those old patterns. Or we end up feeling deprived. We're going to talk about that um, a little bit. Deprived and like, damn it, I just, you know, I just want to have the, I want to go out with the coworkers and have the giant, you know, 10-gallon margarita and the macho nachos and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, and I don't want to feel like I always have to be the good girl, right? I want to just cut loose sometimes. And, and so it's, I really feel like it's that ambivalence um, about, you know, uh, not, not being willing to make the change um, that, that, is, that is our undoing. Um, because honestly, I was right there. I had all that, <laughs> I had all that ambivalence uh, for all those years of, of dieting. And when I had my rock bottom experience and um, you know, and, and, and I, I, I'm a really visual person. So when I think now back on that, on that moment that really was my transformative moment, I, I see a picture. And what I see is that I was walking on a path in my life. We all are, right? We're walking on this path, and we think we're doing all the right things, all the things that we're supposed to be doing. I mean, we're all adults. We have so many responsibilities and obligations. And I was walking on this path, trying my darndest at everything. And then this happened. And instead of the path before me, what was there was a cliff. It was just a cliff. There was nothing there. If I had taken another step, sorry, sometimes I get <laughs> choked up talking about this. I have yet to make it through this talk without crying. Um, so when I, when I saw that in my mind, I knew if I took another step in that life, I was going to fall. I had to turn a different direction and take another path. So transformative change really uh, cemented in my mind that not only um, did I have to choose another path, but I deserved another path. I deserved something better. Because of what I realized is that not changing, you know, the, the staying on the same path really only perpetuated my misery. So number two is, of the five is that resentment is a red flag emotion. A resentment is such an interesting thing. So it's, it's veiled anger, right, is what it is. Um, but if you peel it back another layer deeper, what you find is we feel powerless in some situations. Think about a two-year-old, right? They go crazy. They're angry. But why? Because they have no power in that situation. How many times are we in this situation? I mean, we're going to talk, we talk about it in the sense of, of, of you know, weight loss. If you're dieting, you feel deprived and that kind of thing, and you resent it because you've got to be the one to you know, who has to sit there and eat her celery sticks and, and carrots while everybody else is, you know, indulging. But the resentment is actually an invitation. Just consider that for a second. It's an invitation to get a glimpse into what it is you feel powerless about. And, I mean, for me, I will say that it was that I didn't feel, I didn't feel free. I didn't feel like I had the right to claim my own needs, like whatever, you know, whatever the situation was where I was the two-year-old screaming um, internally because as adults we don't do that. Um, you know, that's, that's what it was. it was. It was that I felt powerless and that my needs didn't seem important enough to give voice to. And so I stuffed them down, in my case literally, with food. So it's a really interesting thing. The next time you feel it, I would just ask you to, to just you know, think about that and see if that rings true for you. So number three is that self-care 
has more to do with setting appropriate boundaries than it does with pedicures, which, you know, I'm just going to admit are awesome too, right? So who doesn't love a pedicure? But as a perennial people pleaser and perfectionist and now recovering good girl, I will say that, um, that self-care really has a lot more to do with, you know, knowing, knowing what's okay to establish as a boundary for yourself. So if you've ever had an elementary school age child, I won't ask for a show of hands this time because I'm guessing probably all of us, and they've had a science fair project, right? And you got to get the trifold, you know the thing I'm talking about, right? And they tell you at like 8 o'clock the night before <laughs> that the science fair Oh, and we were supposed to be growing mold on, you know, bread for the last 10 weeks so we could capture, you know, you've done this, right? And, and so you're just, like, you're just beside yourself. You know, when the kid came home with the, th with the, with the assignment, you talked about it, you kind of brainstormed some ideas, and, you know, you, you, you figured you had, what, like six weeks or something at that point, so it, like, totally fell off your radar. I get that, because, like, I'm, you know, I've four kids. <laughs> I've done this many times. So, so, you know, so then at 8 o'clock the night before, and all of a sudden, y'all are scrambling to get, you got to go get the board, you got to get the money, you got to come up with some sort of experiment that can be conducted in 10 minutes or less, <laughs> right? So, so, like, you're, you know, you're pissed and, um, and maybe resentful. Um, but, um, but here's where, you know, it's an opportunity to, um, depending on the age of the child and what the consequences are going to be, you know, to let them bear the consequences of that themselves. This is, this is me speaking from someone who never actually did this when their child was um, in this situation. <laughs> but, um, but I have learned um, that, um, that, you know, that, that all the demands of all the people in our lives, in all the roles that we fill, you know, not just the child who forgot there uh, that the science experiment was due tomorrow, but, but in all of those roles that we fill, there are lots and lots of people who are asking things of us that aren't necessarily our responsibility. And when we, when we assume those burdens as their burdens as ours, then we're letting them cross a boundary, which isn't necessarily an appropriate boundary. So one thing that I learned along the way is, um, is that, that I, I get to matter too. I get to have needs too. And I get to decide for myself what's important to me. Um, and I mean, <laughs> as a mom, this is a kind of novel thing, right? Um, because we're so used to just being givers. Um, but on, in that moment when I had my crisis in, in 2007, um, I, you know, I, um, I had been running on fumes for so long, giving so much to so many in so many capacities, um, that there just simply was nothing left. And, you know, before that happens, um, to, I certainly warn my 20-something uh, daughters about this, um, that, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't ever have to get that bad. You don't have to do that. You know, it's, it doesn't make you a better person by always being the giver. And, um, and so, um, you know, I, I believe in fearless self-care now, which is really self-love. And it's perfectly okay to assert our boundaries. All right, and this is sort of Marilyn speak, which is um, most of the time I, I speak in a very colloquial kind of way, which is um, how I apparently ended up on this stage because um, uh, Julie from 425 Magazine was saying that she follows me on Twitter, and so of course I apologized immediately because on Twitter I'm really my, my real self, um, which is kind of a loud mouth. Um, so, um, but number four is, ain't nobody going to hand it to you. You've got to go get it. And what I mean by that is that um, there, there is no external source of motivation for transformational change. This is an internal process. This is a completely internal process. You know, we're going to get to the why, you know, I think um, diets are just sort of the ancillary kind of um, part to this, this whole thing. Um, but, but I really feel like, um, you know, my commitment to, um, to healthy living and wellness 
uh, is, a, is an incredible gift that I get to go, you know, pursue every single day. Um, I have no ambivalence about it anymore at all. Um, it's, it's my right and my obligation and my responsibility to do this and take care of myself. Um, and, and really, when you, <laughs> when you think about it, um, fear is a terrible motivator. So people ask me all the time about, you know, how, well, how do I get motivated, you know? Um, and, um, and, I, and I always say, you know, having a, 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 a dress that you want to get into or a, um, a class reunion maybe that's coming up or something, um, these, you know, these are, mo you know, motivators that are external and, uh, and motivated by fear. Like, I don't, I don't like the way I look, and so I've got to, you know, change something. Um, and unless a bear is chasing you, um, fear is a really bad motivator. Because as soon as the event or whatever, the, the threat, even like a doctor's diagnosis, even if it, once the immediate threat is gone, you know, so is your fear, and poof, there goes your motivation. Um, so knowing your personal why is really your best motivator, which gets me to number five, which is that any given diet or exercise plan is just the how. That's just the implementation of the why. But you, per, tapping into your own personal why is really what makes all the difference. So if any of you read um, Oprah Magazine, or O Magazine, I do. So in every, in every issue, she has on the very back page um, a little thing she calls, What I Know For Sure. And back on that day when I had my, my own collapse, kind of rock bottom experience, I had to ask myself that question. What do I know about myself for sure? And what I knew about myself for sure was, is that I, I didn't, wasn't put on this earth to be fat and miserable for the rest of my life. I just wasn't. I knew it. I knew it at my core. And if I knew that to be true, then what did I need to do so that I lived my life in alignment with my values? And as soon as I started doing that, as soon as I started taking action on that, that's my personal why, that's when things really started to click for me. And that really changed everything. So, I, you know, I titled my book, Eat Like It Matters, because that's what I do now. And I really feel like eating like it matters is just part of living like it matters. I mean, and I know it sounds kind of woo-woo and kind of hippie-ish and stuff, but I kind of believe that's what we're all here to do. And in a way, you know, this evening and these other four other incredible women, that's what they're doing. They're showing us by example that living like it matters is part of the gift that we give each other when we're here on this earth. So thank you so much.